Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee that bound them to shimmers now live and work in the dish and are obliged to honor these principles too. We are incredibly honored to be engaging in conversation today with Behrouz Bouchani and Omito Fichion, who have so generously agreed to answer our questions. This is a student-run event, so I am going to step aside in a moment and let the students take over. But I did want to take a quick moment to thank all the different groups who have so kindly supported this event. The Literatures of Modernity Graduate Program, the English Department, the Center for Digital Humanities, the Ryerson Library, CCS Media, the CELT Office at Ryerson, and Penn Canada for all their support and encouragement and patience as we sorted out the details of this event. I also, of course, want to thank the amazing students uh, who have worked so hard for this event and whose intellectual commitments and energy have been incredibly inspiring and rewarding for me personally. Finally, I want to convey my gratitude to Behrouz Bouchani, for whom it is now 2 a.m. Uh, in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, and uh, Omitsu Firion, who is calling in from Cairo uh, at the more reasonable hour of 6 p.m. Uh, I am grateful to them both for their brave and groundbreaking work that challenges the world to confront ongoing colonial and imperialist policies responsible for the disenfranchisement of so many innocent people around the world. Today we are talking about asylum seekers to Australia, a situation that has a strong correlation in Canada as well. But as we speak today, I'm sure we're all also thinking about the recent decision by the US to pull out of Syria, leaving the Kurds completely vulnerable. We have a duty and an obligation to care for and to make room for those among us seeking a safe place to live, to work, to write, to speak. Through their work, Behrouz and Omid make us deeply aware of our responsibility towards others, and I'm truly honored uh, to be able to hear them speak today. I will now turn the floor over to Nikta and Ben, who will be moderating the event. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikta. And I'm Ben. And we are two students here at Ryerson University's Literatures of Modernity program, an English Literature MA program. We are honored to be here today with our fellow classmates and our professor, Nima Naribi, who so graciously set up this event. We are here today to have a conversation with Behrouz Bouchani, a Kurdish Iranian journalist and author of No Friend But the Mountains, as well as his translator, Omi Topirian. First published in 2018 by Pan McNillan, with the Canadian edition from House of Anansi in 2019, No Friend But the Mountains is a narrative that resists the limitations of genre, serving to expose the systematic torture of prisoners held within Australia's refugee detention centers. Through Bouchani's lived experience of seeking asylum and consequentially experiencing imprisonment on Manus Island, Bouchani is a writer, journalist, scholar, cultural advocate, and filmmaker who writes as observer, participant, poet, and philosopher, working to expose and dismantle the curiocal system in the prison. He holds a master's degree in political science, political geography, and geopolitics. He publishes regularly with The Guardian, and his writing also features in the Saturday paper, Huffington Post, New Matilda, Financial Times, and the Sydney Morning Herald. Bhutani is also co-director of the 2017 feature-length film, Chaka, Please Tell Us the Time. He won the Victorian Prize for Literature, in addition to the nonfiction category, the special awards at the 2019 NSW Premier's Literary Awards, Nonfiction Book of the Year, Australia's Book Industry Awards, and the National Biography Prize for No Friend But the Mountains. No Friend But the Mountain's journey to publication is unique, with each piece of the text sent through WhatsApp messaging from Behrouz on Manus Island to Omid, who translated each line of the book from Farsi into English. Omid is a lecturer, researcher, and community advocate, combining his training in philosophy with his interests in rhetoric, religion, popular culture, transnationalism, displacement, and discrimination. His current roles include Assistant Professor of English and Comparative Literature at American University in Cairo, Adjunct Lecturer in the School of the Arts and Media at UNSW, Honorary Research Associate for the Department of Philosophy at University of Sydney, Faculty at Iran Academia, and Campaign Manager for Why Is My Curriculum White. He is the author of numerous book chapters and journal articles, and the monograph Myth and Philosophy in Platonic Dialogues, published by Palgrave in 2016. To quote Omid's translator's tale, 
Behrouz recounts stories in order to produce new knowledge and construct a philosophy that unpacks and exposes systematic torture and the border industrial complex. This discussion will be led with questions for both Behrouz and Omid from our classmates currently participating in the seminar course, Modernity's Others. Again, thank you for being here today, and we hope that you enjoy what is sure to be a thought-provoking and educational conversation. But before we invite our classmates to come and ask their questions, Behrouz, can you please tell us what your current situation is? We know you're no longer in Manus Prison and that you're in Port Mo Moresby. Are you still in detention? Uh, thank you very much. I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, right now, uh, I'm in Port Moresby, which is the capital city of uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, they transferred uh, all of the refugees from Manus Island to Port Moresby just a month ago. So Manus prison or Manus prison camp doesn't exist anymore. So right now I am free, uh, but with uh, very, you know, it's very complicated. It's very uh, hard life. So we are stuck in this city. So I can explain uh, later about the current situation because, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's very complicated because right now we are locked up in some uh, hotels. We cannot go out, uh, but we are free. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, but Manus prison camp doesn't exist anymore. So, and uh, just one thing is that we are uh, 320 people and uh, 50 of us are in a real prison now in Port Moresby. So that's why I should, uh, it's hard to understand. So I should explain, but I think we are gathering here to talk about the book and uh, the whole policy. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to our uh, first questioners. So here you go. Uh, hi, my name is Kimmy. And my name is Johanna. Omid, you write in the translator's tale that you were always conscious of the fact that for Behrouz, to write in Farsi was to write in the language of his oppressors. We are interested in how the text was translated from one language of oppression, Farsi, into another language of oppression, English, the language of Behrouz's jailers and torturers. We are wondering, Behrouz, what would you say was most challenging about working in the languages of your oppressors? And what do the two of you think happens when a text of protest is translated into the language of the oppressor? Um, maybe I'll start by answering and then um, I'll pass it over to Behrouz. Um, first of all, thank you to Em, um, especially Nima for organizing this. Uh, and I think this is a really important question. <clears throat> And um, I, I really uh, uh, want to um, praise uh, Nima for starting the, the seminar with an acknowledgement of country, which is something we do in Australia as well, to acknowledge that we're on Australia and, that, and who the traditional owners are of the different regions, uh, the different um, parts of Australia. Because essentially this book is about, it's about many things. Um, in particular, it's about uh, the situation, the border politics and the border violence in Australia uh, and the situation in Manus Prison. But it's also about colonialism. It's about histories of colonial violence, intersecting forms of colonial violence, uh, and also the, the ongoing struggle, the ongoing resistance against colonial vi violence. So I think one of the things that uh, for me really stood out during the uh, translation process was how Behrouz was forced to write in the language of his oppressors in Iran, the uh, Persian or Farsi. And this is really significant because his mother tongue is Kurdish and so much of his life in Iran has been dedicated to um, preserving and uh, uh, respecting and uh, maintaining and sharing 
Kurdish language and Kurdish knowledge and folklore and uh, and also um, a political visions and visions of freedom. So it's really ironic that um, that he has to write in the language that he went on to be educated in, but is essentially the language of the um, the systems of domination and um, and exclusion that he faced in Iran. So that for me was really important. It really shows the power of language and how language is such a complicated, multifaceted um, uh, tool or, or factor. Um, and also the, the idea that I was translating the, the, the Farsi or Persian into, into English and the fact that he, he received all of this recognition and, and uh, international attention and he's able to be here with you today and, and engage in an English speaking, um, uh, an English instruction university um, because of the fact that English is a colonial language. It's, uh, it's spread and of course there are many kinds of English. There are many um, uh, um, uh, literatures, English literatures within in the plural, but but the fact that it's it, it, we're operating with a colonial language, we're using colonial structures, and even my translation had to uh, uh, incorporate and be aware of the kind of the, the readership, and and that readership had to be how I had to consider the general uh, audience. So you know, there's so many different layers of uh, um, of limitations and uh, and obstacles and oppression and uh, and marginalization that I had to factor in. And to be honest, I'm still trying to work it out. You know, we were under so much pressure to get it done. Um, I, I thought about many of these things. I drew on my own experiences and my own education. But even today, you know, trying to respond to your question, I'm still having to think through so many of these issues. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I should ask Omi to translate the question because mm -hmm. I used to Australian accent. I know uh, it is a very hard <laughs> accent. Australian accent, but we used to this accent. So, Omid Babashid, the Swalish Shibut. Ben Shuma, in Ketobo, Bezabona for Sinevesti, Ke Zabone Hokimiat, your Hushunat to Iran, Barashuma Ke Court Hassi. But man in Ketobo, Bezabone, Ingilisi, um, Taj Mikardam, he is Zabone Estemar Garoi has. Uh, این سوال اول هست سوال دوم هم بعدا جواب دادی سوال دوم رو میپرسن ولی بیشتر مثلا چه حالتی چه احساسی کردی که این خشونت زبان این قدرت زبان رو شما تاثیر گذاشت و شک داد به نوشتنت yeah i think uh, you know omid uh, already mentioned that you know the, the main part of uh, my works you know the articles or the book or the movie is against uh, colonialism because uh, i believe that the whole this policy established on colonialism thinking and mentality because they have been using this uh, land as a place uh, of exile to torture people so that's why uh, you know, when I, when they send me, exiled me to Manus Island, I faced, uh, I found out that it is a kind of colonialist uh, by uh, living there. And, you know, after years and years, I understand it, uh, the situation and, the, you know, this colonialist culture more. But it was very uh, similar to my experience in Iran. Uh, as a court so uh, well, in Iran and you know in Middle East uh, you know a big part of the, the community there deny that the Kurdish people exist and the Kurdish people are a nation and you know right now that I'm talking with you actually you know I'm thinking about Kurdish people in Syria and how uh, the uh, Turkey fascist government attack, uh, uh, you know, our people there. So, you know, what we believe, we believe that Kurdistan is a, an international uh, col colony. And uh, so, you know, what's happened in Iran, you know, I was born as a court uh, and they denied uh, Kurdish people to, you know, educate in uh, their language. 
So uh, I educated in Farsi and that's why, but uh, in Iran, I spent so much time to teach Kurdish to the young generation, to young people. And uh, actually the reason that I left Iran was because of my cultural activi uh, activities. Uh, my works and my advocacy for Kurdish people and particularly about uh, Kurdish language. So of course, uh, but you know, uh, I look at the, I don't politicize the <clears throat> languages, uh, although the languages uh, always are relate to power. And uh, the whole thing that, uh, you know, I have worked and I have uh, tried to do is to create a new language about, you know, the refugees to represent our situation. I know the languages are related to power, to uh, power structures, but, you know, uh, generally, I think we should not politicize the, the languages. Uh, what is important, it's, uh, of course, it's clear that, you know, I, uh, I write this book uh, in Farsi, which is a language that uh, is like a language for colonial, colonialists in, uh, towards the, the Kurdish people against my jailers, you know, against the system that jailed me and uh, so, of course, you know, that is clear, but what is important is that why, uh, what did I write in this book and what did I describe in this book? I think this book is uh, with, uh, you know, on base of Kurdish mentality and th that is important. And even uh, it's quite uh, different with the other writers who write in Farsi. Uh, just I want to ask Omi to translate one word. Omi, the Bashi Ashnoi Zodai Chimishe, the Pambagam Ke. De alienate or, uh, or no, alienate or uh, uh, de disconnect? I want to say that the language of Farsi is not a person who is 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 a person Maybe the best way to describe it is radical reinterpretation or uh, re-evaluate, maybe? Yeah, so you know, in this book, uh, you know, the, the whole, this piece, I think uh, what is important that I, what uh, I describe, but regarding the Kurdish culture, I think what is important is that it is with Kurdish uh, culture and Kurdish mentality. And uh, of course I affected by the uh, Kurdish writers and Kurdish uh, folklore and Kurdish music, even music affected on this book this, uh, you know, piece of writing. And uh, so that's why um, the important thing is that uh, the title of the book is uh, I borrow from uh, a famous uh, verbal in Kurdistan that the Kurd know the, they know have friend but the mountains. And we can see just tonight, you know, just tonight, if you look at Syria, look at Kurdistan, you can see that the Kurdish people defeated ISIS. And in fact, they saved uh, people, but they left them. The superpower left them. And it is not the first time in the history of Kurdistan. You know, it is not the first time. Two years ago, the 92% of people in Kurdistan, in Iraq, voted for uh, independence. But no one in this world support people, you know? And, you know, it, there are many examples. I don't want to talk about politics, but, you know, it's uh, a big layer of this book 
is about politics. And uh, so that's why, you know, I use this title, I, this, uh, you know, the words, uh, uh, and put it on the title just to introduce, you know, uh, this uh, a big part of Kurdish history. So that's why I think it's not important that in which language I use. What is important is that it is with Kurdish mentality, and I introduce, uh, you know, Kurdish culture and uh, you know history of uh, you know Kurdish resistance and Kurdistan resistance in this book. You know, someone wrote uh, on Twitter that tonight I don't know why uh, I, you know, remember No Friend But the Mountains by Beirut Buchani, you know, because he was affected by this, uh, you know, war in Kurdistan. You know, it was very, you know, I don't know how to describe this feeling, but uh, I think, and you know, I, I was very, I was not sure to name the book uh, in this way, because uh, I was not sure what will happen. Yeah, and, uh, but uh, I am happy that I did that. And uh, just one thing, sorry, I talk a lot, uh, I use the, you know, Kurdish and Kurdistan resistance elements in this book and in our resistance in front of Australia, in front of this system. And it is not particularly about the book, you know, the way the refugees have been resisting in front of this system, because there are too much similarity between the resistance in Kurdistan and the resistance in Manus. And for local people, the Manusian people against this uh, system and this uh, uh, government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I will try to uh, answer shortly. Hello, my name is Amanda. And I'm Cosette. Um, so our question is for Omid. Um, so in the translator's tale, you mentioned that translation functions as a framing narrative for the book itself. Considering this framing narrative, you are as much a creator of this text as Beirut. In taking on the responsibility of crafting a text of this magnitude, how much of your perspective is intertwined with the writing of what would otherwise be considered Behruz's text? How did you both create a final product you both felt conveyed the truth of Manus Prison? Um, thank you. Again, a really important question, and um, I really appreciate the, uh, the focus on the literary aspects uh, of the um, uh, of the of the production of the book and of course the translation. Um, when I said, when I described the, the translation process as a framing uh, narrative, um, I, I had uh, Girard Genet in mind uh, and his, uh, his uh, theory or his methodology related to narratology. Um, I guess one of the most common, most well-known uh, examples of frame and framed or framing and Im embedded narratives uh, is um, A Thousand and One Nights, where Shahrazad is the frame narrative and then there's, there's other narratives embedded in it, which have become the main narratives. So I guess I, I kind of looked at um, the relationship that Behruz and I had uh, and the, the stories that go into our own personal stories and our, our interaction with each other and also the story, the political uh, narrative, the political situation um, uh, around surrounding the book as the frame narrative and Behruz's uh, own st his stories, his characters, his symbols, his tropes, his critiques, all of these being the embedded narratives. And it gets even more complicated than that because in Behruz's narratives, there are embedded narratives within those. So there are kind of, um, uh, uh, th there are stories you could say where the, the story embedded in the book uh, is telling another story itself. So there's all these multiple layers. And I think 
maybe for the next 20, 30 years, I'll be discovering more and more about all of these different layers of, uh, of narrative. Um, but I should mention that uh, throughout the whole um, translation process and all of the work that I've been doing with Behrouz, it's been characterized by consultation, collaboration and sharing. So every decision that I made, I consulted Behrouz uh, about. Uh, we, went, we had long discussions sometimes about one word, uh, one phrase, one sentence. Um, you know, we, I was basically communicating with him every day to make sure I had everything right and he was happy with the, with the kind of ideas that I was uh, drawing on. Uh, on top of that, I was interacting with two other people, uh, Munis Mansubi, who is Behrouz's first translator, uh, and she was the one who actually compiled most of the pictures into, into PDFs um, of different chapters. And then when I received the PDF, Behrouz would send me bits and pieces through a text message to add and, and, um, and modify. Uh, and also Sajjad Kabgani, who uh, is a um, researcher, uh, is specializing in literature and um, uh, philosophy. And so I'd meet maybe every week or every fortnight with these other people and uh, share my translation with them and get feedback and we'd have consultation. During those seminars, I'd contact Behrouz and, and double check things as well. So. You know, I, essentially, I have to write a whole book about the translation process. It's too difficult to explain. There are just too many different phases and too many different elements and factors. But I will say uh, something else. Behrouz, I consider him to be one of the translators of this book. Without Behrouz's input, without my uh, interaction with him, without his vision, without his comments, uh, without his modifications, his edits, the translation would have never turned out the way it did. Um, I think there's a particular magic or a very particular kind of uh, power that this book transmits. And that is because there was this really close interaction. Maybe we need a new word to describe this. Maybe translation is not even the right word. It's, it's completely different. It's, it kind of breaks all uh, different uh, categories in terms of genre and style and, uh, and also activism. Uh, but it also breaks all the um, principles and norms associated with things such as translation. So maybe we, like Behrouz creates a whole new language in terms of fighting against the system, maybe we need to create a new language to talk about the production of this fight against the system. Thank you so much. All right, hi, I'm Allison. I'm Anna Maria, and our question is for both Omid and Beirouz. So lately there has been a great deal of discussion about the comparisons between refugee camps and concentration camps during the Holocaust. In her work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt describes the total er erasure of identity in the concentration camps as a particularly cruel form of torture, a form of torture which is employed in refugee camps such as Manus Prison. So our question is, what do you think the effects of this comparison are more broadly? And do you think it any way um, diminishes the experiences of either group? Moreover, how useful is it to employ the language of concentration camps when discussing today's refugee crisis? <laughs> به این سوالش جالب اتفاقا چون الان شما داری هنا رنت رو میخونی سوالش بیشتر تو این چارچوب گفتمان هنا رنت هست میپرسن که این روش تطبیقی بین این زندان ها برا پناهنده ها با اون اتفاقایی که افتاد دوره جنگ جهان دوم اون کمپ هایی که ناتسی ها ساختن برای کشتن آدم ها. به نظرت این یه روش کاربردی هست یا باید یه نگاه دیگه داشته باشیم نسبت به Yeah, I think, uh, you know, many people use the concentration camp for the manus, but I think, uh, of course, Uh, both Manus and, uh, you know, many places around the world uh, with what's happened in, uh, you know, second, during the Second World War, uh, all with the, came from the uh, same mentality. 
of course, that is, you know, without doubt, we should accept that. But I think uh, we should don't compare them because we should understand Manu's prison in this uh, the particular time and this, uh, you know, this particular part of history. And uh, so that's why, so what's happened in Manus is very different in so many ways, because, uh, you know, the first thing is that in Manus, the system doesn't want to kill people, you know, um, uh, the system doesn't want to kill people, although 20, uh, 12 people were killed by the system, but the system always, uh, you know, you know, designed to uh, take your identity, you know, and reduce you to a number and take your individuality and hum humiliate you and force you to go back to where you come from. And the system always, uh, you know, in this system, you always feel uh, death, you know. They put you in a situation, they keep you in a situation through a systematic torture that you always, every day, you feel uh, death you feel that uh, you are going to die by the system. You are going to die by, because of medical neglect. You are going to die because of, you know, starvation. You are going to die. You know, uh, over the past six years, you know, uh, all of the people, the Tainis in Manus, always, you know, for six years, they feel uh, death, you know. And that is, I think, very important because this system, uh, you know, doesn't want to kill people. Just they want that you feel that you are going to die or any time you can die. So that's why I think it's very different. And, you know, uh, many people use uh, many different kind of, you know, concept and words to describe Manus, for example, they said, uh, you know, even myself, you know, I uh, called that uh, prison camp, I called it prison. But I think prison is not the right word. I couldn't find the word, the right word, because prison is not a word to represent the situation. You know, the, the government and the media call that place offshore processing center, which is, uh, you know, ridiculous, you know, offshore processing center. Uh, but, uh, you know, I uh, name it prison, although it's not a prison, you know, because uh, there is a difference between uh, a prison with that place that we were living, you know, because, uh, you know, they are so different. In a prison, uh, a prisoner uh, is in prison. They imprison him or her uh, through a court process. And probably the prisoner did a crime, you know, probably did a crime or, you know, but definitely they imprison people uh, after the court order that this person is criminal and he should be in prison, you know. A prisoner has this right that uh, to have visitor, you know. Uh, there are many, you know, I can give you many examples. It's very different. So that place is not a prison, you know. That place, and uh, some people use, you know, even, you know, I myself, in my articles, I use uh, another word, uh, you know, modern slavery, you know, modern slavery, or another word we can say exile, you know, or exile policy. You know, there are different words, but I think we should create a different word for this, a new word to, uh, to represent this situation, that we understand it. So that's why I think uh, we should uh, don't compare 
uh, this uh, Manus prison system and this exile policy with what's happening uh, Second World War. And we should understand in this way. And, uh, you know, in Manus, we face the systematic torture, a very complicated torture, a torture that, you know, uh, there are many people in behind and they design this, you know, every day they design a new kind of torture, you know, in the prison. So it's very different. So that's why, uh, you know, I think we should don't, and it is very modern, you know, uh, in Second World War, they, you know, just they kill people. But here, you know, we are facing a fascist government that do this and justify this to public uh, under, uh, under morality. They say, we keep people here because we want to save lives on the ocean, you know, which is ridiculous. Turkey government attack Kurdish people tonight and they named the operation Peace Spring. Fuck this word. Peace Spring, you know? They are killing people and they say they name it Peace. They named the operation Peace Spring. You know, peace spring, and they attack a place which is the most progressive and the only democratic system in Middle East, which is Rojava. You can go and Google about it and read about it. That how this small government there that Kurdish people established over the past few years, just few years how they think about equality between men and women, how they uh, think about environment, you know, the most democratic and progressive and the only one in the history of uh, Middle East, you know. They attack that place and, uh, you know, and they name it Peace Spring. Peace Spring Operation. So it's so different, you know. Right now, we are facing a system, I mean the global system, that this uh, current government, you know, became the uh, most dangerous uh, treatment for the world, for our world, the politicians and this system. Because they are doing this under uh, you know, they hide themselves behind morality concepts. So it's very different, you know, they very different. So I think we should recognize this and think about this. And it is not only about Manus and uh, Kurdistan, you know. I am sure in Canada, you know, and I know have knowledge about what is happening there, but I am sure, I am sure that you have a same system there but the level is different, you know, the level is different. That how they, the governments around the world violate human rights uh, and, uh, you know, hide themselves behind morality. So. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Darko. And I'm Marina. And our question is going to be focused around the system in which you're currently held. So these, these internment camps um, are characterized as being a state of exception, but this state of exception is kind of slowly becoming the norm. Do you, Behrouz, feel as though your work has inspired change and in turn a move away from this norm? And between your arrival into the hierarchical system and publishing this work, what, if any, changes have you seen or observed? 
به رو سال اینه که شما شرایط زندان منس رو به عنوان وضعیت استثناء تعریف میکنی ولی الان این شرایط یا این وضعیت استثناء داره عادی میشه داره مثلا قبول میشه یا نهادینه میشه تو زندگی روزمره تو شرط معمولی داره عادی میشه به نظر شما مقاومتش مقاومتی که انجام میدی ضد این عادی کردن یا معمولی کردن این سیستم هست با sorry could you repeat the second question again please yeah between your arrival into the caracol system and publishing this work what if any changes have been observed آها. بعد از اینکه وارد سیستم حاکم شدی با این کتاب تو منتشر کردی چه شکل تغییر کرد شرایطت You know we are uh, talking about curricular system so this curricular system has control on everything you know has control on everything so just imagine someone like me that is writing against this system so what i am doing uh, you know it's very <laughs> i don't know that uh, you know i'm not sure that my english be strong that i explain this but i will try uh, so because it's very important question uh, five years ago i wrote that dictatorship is like uh, you know uh, cancer and spread everywhere you know uh, the australian government you know just few days ago for the first time in a newspaper in australia someone called the immigration minister uh, as a dictator you know as a dictator so what i want to say is that the australian government practiced dictatorship in manus and naro for years and years and now that they you know the australian people australian citizens are facing a kind of dictatorship you know i mean that this whole policy uh, affected the Australian political culture, you know, negatively. And now the government, the, the Australian government is running Australia as a camp, you know, as a camp state. So I think there are many examples that I can, uh, you know, give you, share with you, that what is happening in Australia, you know, there is not a guarantee for democracy, you know, When you do this in Manus and Nauru, you know, in fact, you, you know, what they did, they created uh, a kind of language, you know, to do propaganda on base of that language. So this language that the government created, you know, you know, affected on the society, you know, uh, but what wh what I am, working and what i have been working uh, is against working against this uh, language this language that is uh, related to the power structure you know so i am attacking this system deeply so it's not like this that i am sitting in manus and i just reporting no reporting is a part of my works you know I am trying to create a, a new language, you know, you know, to replace that language uh, that created by the, the government. So that's why, of course, you know, there is a, the, I, you know, I, I call this whole policy like a, a, a detention industry, you know, and even The journalists, the media are a part of this system. They are helping the curricular system. Uh, but pro of course, or probably they are not aware of it, you know. 
because they are using the language by the government, you know. Their language is not uh, strong, their language is not free. And even the humanitarian organizations are a part of this system, you know, but they are not aware of it, you know. They are not aware of it. You know, in so many ways, these structures, like the organizations who are fighting against this system, in fact, they are uh, helping this system, this curricular system. So that's, you know, my perspective is, you know, as a person who experienced this, is uh, different, you know, is different. And of course, even I myself, you know, even I myself, that I'm fighting and writing against this system in some ways can be uh, become a part of the system, you know? Like what? Like what? I made the movie, you know, I made the movie. So if you want to watch the movie, you should pay six dollars, you know? Why? Because I cannot uh, release the m movie just like that, you know? I am in Manus, so I have uh, someone should pro uh, be a producer, you know? So he say that I should, uh, I spend money to make this movie, so I should get my money back, you know? This book that you are reading, you know? This book that you are reading, you know? But what I want to say is that uh, it's really hard that even when you are fighting this, against this curricular system or this system, you don't be, become a part of it, you know? It's hard, it's, uh, it's impossible. In some ways you become, but you know, uh, someone actually, you know, just I want to say this, you know, I became like a celebrity in some ways, you know, and some people, you know, sometimes I think about this, that uh, this celebrity culture, you know, uh, you know, is against, uh, you know, the way I am working, you know. I cannot work and people don't know me, you know. Sometimes, you know, I receive many awards, you know. I must accept them, you know, because I am, I were living in a remote island, you know. Even sometimes when you write a love letter, love poem, in fact, you are uh, challenging the system because you are uh, spreading the words and you are saying that you are a human, you know. You can be a lover, you can love someone, you know. So that's why it's really hard to work in these circumstances, you know. But uh, the important thing is that uh, I am aware of these kind of things and I'm aware uh, and I'm fighting against this, you know, celebrity culture. I'm fighting against, but the important thing is that I am working in a way to create a, you know, to use my language, you know, which is a, a free language. I mean, free of the structures, free of the system, and free of the current culture, you know. What I say, sometimes I, <laughs> I wanted to write an article against myself, you know against myself that you are fighting against this system you know you are fighting against this system but your problem is this but you know i didn't write it because uh, i think it is a uh, very heavy uh, discussion uh, and discourse for australia australia is very Australian people 
you know, they stuck in the system. So, you know, I think most of people say that, oh, this man is crazy. So he is writing against himself. You know, even in Australia, when, you know, I, I did some tweets against the High Commissioner of Human Rights in Australia, you know, and everyone attacked me. That why you attack me? He, she's our hero, you know? But in fact, she was not a hero. She was helping the system, you know? She was helping the system. So that's why, you know, sometimes uh, it's really hard to write about something and needs the time. We should wait and see. So uh, sometimes it's better you forget about something. But, uh, you know, of course, creating change is not easy just by writing a book or making a movie or, you know, it's not easy. So it will take um, a long time so because you are creating you should create a new perspective so which is really hard thank you hey so uh, my name's Jang I'm Cole um Baruz, you said in an interview that when you were put into the camps, you told the Australian guards you were a writer and they laughed at you. Later, when you had written your book, you considered writing it under a pseudonym because you feared retribution. However, once you've established an ongoing relationship with multiple journalists, you felt confident enough to publish under your own name. What makes activist writing at once easy to dimis dismiss while also so threatening? How do you think the risks you took in your own writing influenced the global understanding of the prison exile narrative? Behruz, you are the first time in the life of Manus, you are the first time in the life of Manus. You said that I am a writer with the members of the prison. بعد که شروع کردی منتشر مقالات منتشر بکنی زیر یه اسم دیگه می نوشتی با اسم خودت نمی نوشتی بعد که ارتباطات قوی تر شد با اسم بهروز بوچانی منتشر می کردی به نظر شما چرا این نوشتن یا این نقدای اساسی و این فعالیت های مقاومت چرا اینقدر ازش میترسن با چطور تونستی یه نگاه جدید نسبت به تبعید و بیجا بیگانگی به وجود بیاری ببخش یعنی مثلا سیستم از من نمیترسه میترسه نه چ... چرا میترسن از این اینو نوشتن به نظرت برای اینکه خیلی راحت شما رو رد میتن ولی از همزمان هم ازت میترسن چرا؟ I think uh, that this uh, question I think the, the answer I'm going to say is related to what I said in the last uh, answer you know uh, which is uh, you know this system knows that uh, you know when someone uh, has a, you know independency you know in thinking you know and doesn't follow what the system is doing you know even the universities you know the universities are the similar the one of the most similar structures to Manus prism system, you know, even the universities. So I think all of these uh, are a part of this system in some ways, you know, and in some ways. So uh, of course, the system always scared of words, you know, scared of literature, scared of art because you can't say so much, you know, to from journalism to, you know, literature and uh, to 
you know, I, I, I don't blame the, uh, all of the journalists, you know, I mean the current journalism language. Uh, so that's why I shifted my work to arts, to cinema, to literature, you know, to uh, say too much, you know, to challenge the system, to challenge the system, to expose the soul of system, you know, to expose the system deeply. I, I, I'm not sure that I am successful or not, you know, I'm not sure. So people should say that. Uh, but uh, the way I am working, you know, with Omid, uh, the way we are working is to challenge the system through words, through art. So that's why, of course, the system scare of, uh, you know, uh, people who uh, are independent, you know, even the, the you know, uh, but it's really hard that you work and be independent in a circumstances like this, you know, that the, you follow your own perspective, you know, your own language, not the language that uh, is used by the humanitarian organizations and or in with the journalist or with the media or with the government, you know. So that's why, uh, you know, of course, if I be in that position, uh, yeah, I ask her to. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily. And I'm Anna. This question is addressed to both Beruz and Omid. In our class, we have raised the question of how to translate our reading of books like No Friend But the Mountains into actual social change. We want to ask you, how can we work to affect actual change in the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers? Mm. Maybe I'll begin and then I'll um, pass over to Behrus. And um, uh, very briefly, I think uh, my, we need to maybe take a, a, a multi-pronged approach to trying to transform the, the current situation involving borders and um, marginalization and oppression of displaced and exiled people. So the first thing I think it's important is to understand that we're dealing with an industry, the detention industry. Uh, it's a business. It's, um, it involves uh, international companies or, or um, multinational companies. Um, it's interesting, actually, in Behrouz's film, I only found this out recently, but um, uh, Behrouz's co-director, Arash, told me that uh, one of the logos that is in the background of one of the scenes in the film is actually uh, a Canadian company. So, um, you know, what happens on Manus Island is actually has its, some of its origins or has, has roots in Canada. So, you know, these, I think it's called Aramco or something like that. Um, so what, what we're dealing here, uh, what we're dealing with here is, is an industry and um, to cut off the supply chain, to stop the flow of resources and funds into this industry is difficult and it needs collective action. It needs a lot of organizing. Um, one of the things that I've been influenced by is the abolition movement, the prison abolition movement in the United States. Um, and you know, they've, uh, they've been extremely successful because they've been organizing and they have this intergenerational approach uh, that goes back to the 60s. And um, so they target uh, the, the way that prisons uh, uh, supported, are financed, are sustained, and they also um, have moved from taking a, a more national or federal approach and working on a state level or, or, or a regional level. So maybe to close down detention centres, we need to find out, um, uh, or we need to make them unsustainable. We need to make them unfeasible. Um, a lot of people are making a lot of money. One of the things that Behrouz talks about in his journalism is uh, all the, the money that's gone into this. And, you know, a lot of wasted money, a lot of stolen money, uh, a, a lot of people profiting out of um, misery and, um, and uh, people's um, uh, experiences of forced migration. So to find out which companies are involved, cutting off the supply chain, needs this particular approach. You, you might even find that your own university is invested in immigration detention in Canada. You know, uh, until 2015, 
um, university superannuation in Australia was invested in immigration detention. Um, there was very little, and even now, after 2015, even now, we're not really sure if they've completely divested from it. They've made an announcement, but it's not transparent. It's hard to, it's hard to look, uh, find the paper trail. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's possible, uh, you know, you might even have research projects by some academics in different departments at your university that are engaging with the government, that are um, uh, working with um, uh, industries or companies or, or um, institutions that have these connections and are maintaining immigration detention or, you know, policies that, um, that make it difficult for people to move freely. Um, I don't have a simple answer for that particular part. Uh, it, it, it involves a lot of organizing, a lot of investigation. You need to look at things from a financial perspective, from a corporate perspective, and also uh, government policy. And this eventually, working as communities, working as collectives, you're able to transform the kind of rhetoric and the kind of vision that politicians introduce. Once people start to see that their taxpayer dollars are going into um, making people's lives her so horrific that they are forced back to where they fled from, um, suddenly people will start to use a different language, they'll start to invest money in different kinds of programs, then you'll start to have different political representation. Uh, very briefly, I'll move on to the other um, strand that I think is important, and that is more epistemic. Um, at the moment, we have a situation where uh, refugees are perceived as being weak, needy, um, broken, uh, incapable of making decisions, people that need to be saved, you know, this victim savior binary is so deeply ingrained in the way people engage with refugees. And I think this is one of the things that's extremely beautiful and inspiring about Behruz's book and his resistance in general, that he completely disrupts this whole binary. You know, even our relationship, it's not like I'm a savior, he's a victim. Uh, I'm benefiting more from this collaboration than Behrouz probably is. I've learned so much from him. I, so many things have opened up for me. You know, there's a whole different um, uh, different set of concepts and frames of reference we need to use to think about the kind of activity that we're engaged in. I, I refer to it as a shared philosophical activity. So it's not this kind of like uh, recipient um, um, uh, supporter relationship or benefactor, beneficiary relationship or victim savior. It's completely different. And, and um, uh, to transform this, to start to change this, we need to make books like Behrouz as part of the education system, high schools, universities, uh, PhD students need to start working on this. Uh, you know, his, uh, his ideas and his new concepts and the, uh, the, the new ways of um, uh, challenging the system need to become a, a part of academic language because if we stick to the kind of norms and customs and traditions and methodologies and organizational networks that are ingrained in institutions like universities, nothing will end up changing. We'll just keep replicating this kind of division between um, those who are um, subject to persecution and those who want to want to help do something humanitarian. And this in itself is part of the problem as well. Um, this book would never have been able to be made if I kind of followed all the advice of what academic, about what academics should do in terms of building a career. This was a, a renegade movement, a moment. It was a renegade strand in academia. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that it, it, we need multi-dimensional, multi-pronged approaches to changing things. One of them is looking at the economic, political, um, corporate side. The other one is looking at the epistemic and the symbolic. Behruz, سوال این بود که چیکار باید کرد که تغییر ایجاد بکنیم که مطمئن باشیم که این اتفاقها این خشونت ها ادامه نداشته باشن با دیگه دوباره دوباره پیش نیاد یا نه فرست ای تینک ای شود مینشن دیس دات یا نه someone like me that I have been uh, in this in exile for more than six years you know it is my experience I worked with uh, many organizations many people many journalists and on many different uh, projects uh, 
it is my experience I want to, I would love to share with you is that we should rely on individual people, not on the organizations and structures, you know. So the individuals are able to create uh, change. We cannot create change through the organizations. Even if the name of the organization is piece of what, piece of what, uh, an organization for human rights, an organization for support what, the organization for protect women, you know, we cannot create change through this organization. And, you know, this, the fake names, you know, uh, we affect by these fake names. Of course, this organization in some ways are able to help, but the change, we should create change, uh, you know, first from ourselves and, you know, and we should rely on individual people, you know, not the structures. Uh, that is very important. So what I omit, what uh, omit state is that, uh, you know, uh, we should, uh, you know, put this book included as an education system. Uh, I think uh, it's very important that we transform this experience to the young generation, you know. Uh, so I think the young generation, we can't find them in the universities, you know. So we should uh, educate people and uh, transform this experience. You know, you know, I have been working for years just to create these materials, you know, um, you know, which is a movie, you know, another movie, book or articles. And not only me, uh, many people have worked and write and create the thing about man that what so now the duty you know I did my duty you know as a uh, you know writer you know as a writer so Omid میخوام اینو بگم من نمیخوام الان دیگه من این کارا رو انجام دادم مردم دیگه الان انتظار دارن که من بیام به عنوان میشل فوکو هم بیام اینجا اینجا رو تحلیل کنم اینا رو بیام کارهای نظریش هم انجام بدم الان ما داریم این کارو میکنیم دیگه من نمیخوام در مورد این من میخوام برم یه رمان دیگه بنویسم I've created uh, I've provided my materials I've, I've created uh, the literature that I aim to produce um, I've, I've uh, Presented what I've my, my work uh, to the world now. I, I it's it's not it um, People shouldn't expect that now I uh, Take another step and provide or theorize about what I've written and what I've what I've been trying to do um, This is the job of other people. I want to basically go and write another no another novel that's that's my role. I've fulfilled my role. It's the role of other people to now come and theorize and then organize um, different forms of action. Now, in fact, I am doing this. You know, in fact, I should uh, you know theorize these works. You know, right now I am doing this. You know, that's why I am here. I am talking with you. You know, so but it is not. Uh, you know, I you know this experience. I, uh, you know, I write it down or through articles or, you know, book, you know, all of these works and put it on the table. So now is the duty of the uh, researchers and uh, academia to work on this, you know, and use these materials and produce new works, you know. So, but now, I am Omid. So Omid is a researcher, so it's different with me, you know. But now, uh, everywhere we go, we should uh, theorize. Theorize. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. enough. But I think, but we are doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
I will say that even me, uh, as a as a theorist, I I need I need institutional support, and I need people to uh, basically work. Uh, in opposition to maybe a lot of the organizational networks and all of the kind of um, corporate conditions that um, people uh, are subject to, to in fact um, open up spaces and maybe provide new forms of support. Um, Behrouz needs it, I need it, everybody working uh, to, to change things, to basically promote this, these particular critiques, need to work together to, to make things happen. Well, thank you. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for audience questions. So I'm going to thank uh, Professor Nagimi and the Ryerson Library and the CDH and everyone else who helped uh, give us the space to have this talk today, as well as our fellow students for bringing their questions. But most of all, we'd like to thank uh, the two of you for joining this conversation today, particularly because in light of the early hour that it is for you as opposed to us. Um, we thank you both for furthering this necessary conversation, and we hope that you get some sleep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.